and welcome to the Bethel Church Podcast, located in the heart of the Black Hills. Our focus is to live, grow, love, and serve for the sole purpose to make Jesus known. Turn your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to get going on this. We are starting with uh, the first two chapter, uh, two verses that we started on last week. And I'm going to kind of give you a refresher for just a moment. But this is what it says. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by spirit by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Last week we looked at Paul's warning of false teachers in the church, how false teachers had integrated the church, and Paul is writing this letter to really warn the people to watch out for them. He wasn't just referring to pastors. He was referring to anybody, anybody who comes in and teaches a doctrine or teaches a theology type thing that is different from that which we stand on in the Word of God. Amen? So that's what he was doing. He talked about the Judaizers, which were the big problem that he was having. The Judaizers were those that held tightly to religious aspects of church. They held close, they held to themselves tight a teaching that was contradicting what God had said. God said, I will say, you know, salvation, and Paul was talking about salvation comes through what? Jesus dying on the cross, rising again. And we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, and we serve him. That's salvation in a nutshell. So Judaizers were coming in going, okay, wait a minute, but you have to understand, we were the first, so therefore we must be right, so we, you have to do everything that we had to do in order to follow Jesus. All that stuff is great, the grace, the mercy, all that that comes with it, the, the forgiveness of sin, all that's fine. But there's a religious aspect to it that we as Jews do that you have to do too. And the biggest one was circumcision. That was the biggest one they talked about. Those were things that they would teach that uh, set them apart, that separated them from good teachers and false teachers. So he was warning them of how they are like dogs seeking to devour and who, distinguishing themselves as good, were actually doers of evil. That, that's what Paul was saying. They held to the notion that unless you were circumcised, ritualistically, as the Jews were under the law, you could not be a Christian or a Christ follower. Keeping the law was their focus. Acts 15.5, some who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise him, that is, the Gentiles, and to order them to keep the law of Moses, to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now, if you come into a church and they say, okay, you're demanding or you're ordered to follow these rules in order to come to church here, most people would leave. You can't wear a hat in church. You can't wear jeans in church. You have to wear a dress. All these things like this were things that were ritualistic, they were very ceremonial, and very legalistic to get down to it. So that was what Paul was dealing with. Then he brings up dangers. He brings up three dangers that we need to help us discern those things within the church. The first two, danger of religion, that was one of the ones we talked about last week, and the claim of authenticity. And we want to look at today the third one. And this is the one we're going to be on today and uh, finish up this portion. The marks of true Christianity. That is the third one. The marks of true Christianity. What then are the marks of true Christianity? Paul makes this claim of authenticity. We are the true people of God. And then he gives reasons for it. I want you to notice here the marks of true Christianity. You see it in the rest of verse 3. This is what it says. This is what Paul says. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in what? The flesh. Put no confidence in the flesh. He says three things. We're going to look at no confidence in the flesh more next week. I'll get into that later. We have to understand what he's saying in all this stuff. He is really looking at this right here. Those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Those who worship by the Spirit of God. 
You don't worship by the Spirit of God by including or by bringing in ritualistic behavior in the church. There are some churches, honestly, out there in the world that would look down on us today because we're wearing sports jerseys to church. Get over it. Can we have fun in church? Is church okay? We're talking about shooting stuff in church. There's no participation trophies. Some of you will get that later. Because I should have gotten one. I participated. The reigning champ, I should have gotten something. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it was funny because I was, I was there. Sorry. <laughs> I was there. I have you know, my, my, come on, Remington 870 American made shotgun, 12 gauge. That's what I got, right? Well, I have a pouch full of shells. I'm just shoving them in. Pull! And the first one, it was like knock my shoulder off. And I'm like, oh, man, there's that three-incher I wasn't looking for. Shoved it in, and from then I was just toast. So, yeah, so I blame it on that. <laughs> so the first thing, the first thing we see is we worship by the Spirit of God. The word worship there is an important Greek word, and it carries the idea of service or a devotion to the Lord. It encompasses more than what we do at 9 o'clock or at 10.30 on a Sunday morning or at 10.15 today. It's not just what you sing. It's not just that you raise your hands or when you pray or you bow your heads or you take communion or any of that kind of thing. All those are important, but that's not what Paul has in mind. The word carries the idea of one's entire service and devotion to God in one's everyday life. So every day, every step we take, every word we speak is worship to God. And if you are not doing the things of God, then you are not living a life of worship. That's what worship is, and that's what he's speaking of, and that's what that Greek uh, meaning of the word worship here and what Paul is speaking actually means. It means your entire self is engaged in worship, not just at church, but the other days of the week as well. It was the one word, it was the word used to describe the service of the Levites in the Old Testament who were devoted to the service of the Lord. It's the same thing. This is where our value here at Bethel, worship is our passion. That is where it comes from. We worship with our life, our entire being of all we are. During good days and bad days, we carry with us the truth of the gospel. This is my confidence. Not in anything else. This is what I place my value in. My value is found in the word of God. And if you're in this room today and you don't believe yourself to be valuable, pick this up. Because God will show you how valuable you are. Your life is a life of worship. Notice how Paul describes it. He says, we worship by the spirit of God. Again, there is this contrast between worshiping by the spirit of God and worshiping in another way that's not by the spirit. I think what he has in mind is worshiping by the letter, worshiping according to the law. That's what the Judaizers were doing. Their worship came according to the law, right? That's the same thing the Pharisees did. The Pharisees come in here and they say, okay, well, you have to obey the Ten Commandments. You have to, they had all this stuff, the law of Moses, all these things laid out. And they said, we, you have to do this or you can't. That's why they threw the lady that was caught in adultery. They threw her before the feet of Jesus and said, okay, what do you do now? Well, he brings this whole new concept in because Jesus believed in the, in the, the uh, Ten Commandments. He believed in them. But he takes it a step further to make it absolutely impossible to follow them. Remember what he said? Ten Commandments says what? Thou shalt not murder, right? Let's go King James for a minute. Thou shalt not murder. Then what does Jesus do? It is written... Thou shalt not murder, but here's what I tell you. If you have hatred for your brother or sister in your heart, you have committed murder. That is impossible because we are human. So Jesus actually takes up the Ten Commandments a notch. So it made it impossible for the Pharisees to actually... Do you know that's why Jesus died? That's why they crucified him. 
because he starts introducing this, this stuff to him that takes him away from this whole law and where you have to follow the letter of the law, and he introduces grace into the picture, and the Pharisees didn't believe in grace. They said you have to do it. It was an action type thing. The only action that God requires is repentance. That's an action word. We actually engage in repentance. That's not something God gives us. God doesn't give us repentance. We repent. He gives us forgiveness as we repent. Two different things. You see, it's the law versus the grace. It's worshiping in the spirit by, versus worshiping the letter of the law. And that's what Paul was warning against here. Listen to Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Do you hear the contrast? There's a new way. There's an old way. There's a new covenant. There's an old covenant. There's an old generation. There's a new generation that we see today. Come on, somebody. There's this older generation that you are... Let me, let me talk to the, the older generation in the room for a minute. You are needed now more than ever in the history of the world. Let me explain why. Because we need you to speak the truth of God into the new generation that's coming in that have no idea. They're just looking for some truth. They don't need us telling them, hey, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do this. They need us to tell them, this is how you hear the voice of God in your life. Should have got more amens than that. It's a good little spurt. So look at that, even the younger generations amen in it. That's what they need. The new way is characterized by the work of the Spirit of God. Listen, this is always what the Old Testament was pointing to. The Old Covenant was always temporary. Always. It was always provisional. It was always leading to something else, something better. It was always pointing in a different direction. In fact, when you get into the Old Testament prophets and you read their language, the way they spoke, they talked about a new covenant or an everlasting covenant. They begin to give terms to that new covenant. They are terms that then get fulfilled in the New Testament. It started in the Old Testament talking about what Jesus was about to do. It started way back. For example, Ezekiel chapter 36. The Lord says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. When Paul says we worship by the spirit of God, that's what he has in mind. It's that new thing that's coming. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in the new covenant following the advent of Jesus Christ. The power of the indwelling of the Spirit of God in our lives that changes us and transforms us so that our whole lives become service and devotion to God. Our whole lives become worship. You want to follow, you want to follow everything written in this book? It's okay to try. But it's not okay to say, if I don't do it, I'm in trouble. What is okay is to understand what the grace of God looks like. But it's not okay to say the grace of God is a license for my immorality. That's not okay. I try to do everything written in it. Joshua, I mean, God told Joshua in Joshua 1.8 to meditate on his word and be careful to do everything written in it. Well, so that means that we're supposed to do what's in it. We're supposed to be obedient. But sometimes, how many know we fall short? Sometimes we mess up. We're a bunch of messed up people in here. But I can tell you this, only by the grace of God, because if we lived in the Old Testament, we might, half of us might not be in this room right now. But by the grace of God and the new covenant that Jesus brought in, thank God for mercy and grace. It's always when church, when the church recovers this. It's understanding and the necessity of the work of the Holy Spirit for genuine Christianity. That's always when revival comes. That's when it happens. Just think of the Great Awakening in the 1730s and the 40s. George Whitfield, he experienced these things. On one hand, before he really understood the gospel, he was the, uh, the quintessential legalist, if you will. Okay, that's who George Whitfield was. He had joined the Holy Club there in Oxford. 
the holy club. How do you like that? That already tells you what they're about. It was this group of a dozen or two dozen young men who were pursuing God with spiritual disciplines and rigor. But there was no gospel. There was no joy. There was not any real deep trust in Jesus Christ and his saving work. They didn't really understand the gospel and didn't feel they needed it. It was killing, literally killing George Whitfield. Listen to this description that comes from his personal journal. Okay, This is what he says. I began, now I want you to keep in mind, I want you to think about this. I began to fast twice a week for 36 hours together. Prayed many times a day. Received the sacrament, communion, every Lord's Day. I fasted myself almost to death all the 40 days of Lent, during which I made it a point to never go less than three times a day to public worship, besides seven times a day in my private prayer. Yet I knew no more that I was to be born a new creature in Christ Jesus than if I had ever been born at all. The turning point came when his friend Charles Wesley, anybody heard of Charles Wesley? When Charles Wesley comes into the picture, gives him this book, it's called uh, The Life of God in the Soul of Man by a guy named Henry uh, Skugel. It essentially said that in order to be saved, one had to have this experience of new birth. Become a new creation in Christ Jesus. The life of God had to be imparted into one soul so that they became a new person. It wasn't until he read that and he understood it. Whitfield read this and it changed his life. But it didn't happen immediately. In fact, it pushed him further into the rigor of his spiritual disciplines. He started withdrawing from society. From his friends. He started making choices with his diet and his sleep habits. That he would do all that just to be harder and harder and harder on his body. Trying to humble himself to get to the point where he could be saved. You cannot earn salvation by working things out. You work out your own salvation, but you can't earn salvation. God, I'm good enough now. I'm I'm clean now. Can I be saved now? He says, no, I want you dirty. I want you filthy. I want you nasty. I want all the stuff that comes with you because that's the only way you can be changed. You'll never rid yourself of all the garbage in your life unless you let him do it because you can't do it by yourself. It was so bad there were points when he would go out in the cold in the frigid winter weather without gloves on his hands. He would stay outside until his fingers began to turn black. He was getting frostbitten. He would stay all night in the cold outside. He made himself sick. He was so uh, physically gone that a doctor put him to bed for seven weeks. He was literally killing himself trying to save himself. But finally, change came, and he began to understand the gospel. Listen to what he says. God was pleased to remove the heavy load, to enable me to lay hold of his dear son by a living faith and by giving me the spirit of adoption to seal me even to the day of redemption. It was when he laid hold of Christ by faith and he received the spirit of God that his life began to change. Within a couple of years, he was preaching this very message and revivals were breaking out. He was preaching justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. And he was preaching new birth through the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And thousands were being brought into the kingdom. But this only came after he began to lay aside religion and lay aside ceremonial issues and began to pick up the gospel and claim to himself, I can't do this by myself. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Why tell this story? What's the point? Because it's good for us to know some church history, partly. But I think it illustrates what Paul is saying here. Worshiping God by the Spirit of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And partly because I want to awaken us to this crucial distinction between religion, which can check off all the boxes of all the things you think you must do in order to be a Christian. I go to church, yes. I've been baptized, yes. I've been taking communion, yes. I sing the songs. I don't just stand there. I sing. Check. Bonus. I raise my hands. But there's a distinction in the gospel which points you not to yourself 
and the earning of anything, but to what Jesus Christ has done and what he now does in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want us to duplicate Whitfield's experience of misery before finding Christ, but I do, I do want us to lay hold of the Son of God, to hold on to Jesus by a living faith so that we ourselves have experienced the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. Maybe that's the word you need this morning. You need to lay off some religion. You need to pick up what Jesus has for you. It's not what you do. It's what Christ has done in you. Amen? Amen. So there's more to this, but this being Father's Day, how many are thankful for fathers? Just thankful for, thankful for men in general. Men are good. Well, every man likes a certain thing, so we're going to take a little bit of a break here. We're going to call this a bacon break, all right? So we're going to take a bacon break for a minute. So if my guys would come now and uh, come in the back doors, and then, listen, if you want some bacon, we got bacon for you. We got, let's, let's, let's have a snack. We got bacon. Come on, where's my bacon boys at? Come on in. Come on, we got bacon. What man don't want bacon? Hey, listen, if you want turkey bacon, raise your hand. We got some of that too. I'm not sure about you, but we got some. Just got some over here, man. We got some guys. Don't miss them. Hey, men, don't miss them. This may be your chance to get a piece of bacon right now. I cooked this bacon for five hours yesterday. Come on, take some bacon. Look at that. Here we go, right here. My guys. Five hours. Five. Hey, you online, I'm sorry. You should have been here. Love you. Hey. It's man time. Ladies, you want some bacon? We don't want to leave the ladies out. Man, the religious people in the room are squirming right now, aren't you? Hey, give it up for these guys, man. We'll have it in the lobby. If you want some on your way out, you can get some. Number two. Number two. He does this work in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. We worship by the Spirit of God. And then he leads us to this. We glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. We put no confidence in the flesh. The glory, the word glory here, literally means to boast. We boast in who he is. In fact, the word that is translated boast over and over again in Paul's letter, especially to the Corinthian church, but also in Ephesians. Listen to this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Lest anyone should boast on yourself. You have nothing to boast about. I have nothing to boast about. I can't brag about who I am in Christ, but I can brag about what he did in my life to make me who I am in Christ. I can't brag because I did something to earn it. I didn't do anything to earn anything. Here's the deal. Everybody's going to boast in something. Everybody's going to depend on something. Everybody's going to have confidence in something when it comes to your relationship with God. You're either going to be looking to yourself or you're going to be looking to Christ. But you can't do both at the same time. Because why? what did Jesus say? Deny yourself and follow me, right? Deny yourself. Listen to one more passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Whitfield actually preached this verse 
and he called it the believer's golden chain of privileges. All right, that was the name of the message. Listen to what he says. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why do you boast in Christ Jesus? Why, why glory in Christ and not place any confidence in the flesh? Because in Christ you get wisdom. In the flesh you don't. Because the flesh is always desiring sin. The flesh will always desire something that's not of God. That's why there's a battle between good and evil. That's why there's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Okay. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is the way of salvation. In Christ you get righteousness. Because through this, and through putting confidence in him, you are dying to yourself. That's how salvation takes place. Dying to yourself and walking in the mantle of his death and resurrection. That's salvation. Through his obedience and his righteousness credited to your account, you are justified. There is transformation. There's life change. You do become a new creation in Christ. I'm thankful for that. I'm not the same as I was back then. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're made holy. So not only... Are you declared righteous, but you're made righteous? You're sanctified. You're being separated from evil. But how? Through the union with Jesus Christ. As you die to sin and you live to righteousness through his death and resurrection. The question is, religion or the gospel? That's the question we have to ask. What are you trusting this morning? Are you trusting in your baptism? When you were baptized, water baptism, listen, it is important. And listen, we got some people getting baptized in the next month or so that I'm excited about. And if you haven't been baptized, I want to encourage you to sign up to be a baptized. You need that. That's part of our journey with Christ. But we don't put all of our trust in that. We don't put all of our trust in the fact that I was baptized, so therefore I must be good and heaven bound. I can do whatever I want to do. That's not how it works. Same with church membership or church attendance. We want you here. We want you here every week. I want to pack this house out every week with people that are ready to receive what God has for them. I want that. I want it bad. But I'm going to tell you this, that is not your salvation. Your salvation is in him. Your giving. Bible reading, you're praying, are you trusting all that? Are you trusting in the Ten Commandments? Are you trying to live by the Sermon on the Mount? What is it? All those are good things, but none of them, none of them will save you. They will lead you. Reading the Bible, praying, that kind of stuff will lead you into a deeper relationship with God. But there's only one place you can place your trust and your confidence, and that is in Christ alone. It is in Him. This If this doesn't sink into your heart and become part of who you are, it's just a book. It's got to permeate your soul. It's got to sink in deep. Today I encourage you, wherever you may be, wherever you may be in your relationship, if you don't have a relationship in God today, I want to encourage you to make that decision. It's the greatest decision I ever made. And I'll tell you, there's a ton of other people in here right now that will tell you the same thing. It's the greatest decision I've ever made. I would never, I don't want to go back. I never want to go back. So if you're here this morning, you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't have that. And today, I need to meet him. I need to make him my savior today. So what I'm going to ask you to do, there's a little card right in front of you, sitting on your seat, pockets. I'm going to ask you to fill that card out, and I want you to tell me. I want you to write on it. I'll see them. I want you to write on it. Today, I accepted Jesus. And then I want you in your heart, because, listen, there's no magical formula. I can lead you in a little prayer, that kind of stuff. That's cute. But what really matters is what your heart says. 
It's a heart change that takes place. Raising my hand, that doesn't save me. Saying a little prayer, that doesn't save me. What saves me is me making the decision in my heart to change my life, to allow God to change my life. That's where salvation comes in. So if you make that decision today in your heart and you say, you know what, today I need to meet Jesus. I need to know him. Please fill that card out because we want to get you hooked up in D1. We want to help you grow and walk on this journey with you. If we don't know, we can't help you. That's just facts of life. If I don't know, I can't lead you to the right place to go to help you grow. So if you make that decision today, please write that down. And it's simple as this. Jesus, I want to make that decision in my heart. He sees your heart. The second thing is this. If you're here today and, man, you, maybe you're just stuck with religion. A lot of religion going on and some of the things we've done today has even made you roll around a little bit inside, giving you a little turmoil. From the sports theme to the balloons on the stage, Lord help me. The bacon. If that's thrown you off some and it's made you question this church, I want you to question one more thing. Do I have the heart of a Pharisee? Am I religious too much that I need to repent and let God change me? I'm not calling anybody out. I'm just saying it's the, it's the facts. It's the truth. Heavenly Father, I just pray today for every person here. I pray, God, if there's people in this room right now, Lord, that, man, we need to repent of some things. We need to turn some things over to you. I pray, Lord, right now that you'll begin to speak to us. Begin to speak to us internally. Begin to speak to our hearts. Say, these areas you need to change. These areas you need to give to me because you're holding on to them too tight. And Lord, for those that are contemplating that decision, who are going back and forth with, do I, do I really want to be a believer? Do I really want to be a Christian? Do I really want to follow Christ? Lord, I pray right now that the love of Jesus will just flow over them, Lord, that they will feel your tugging, the tugging of the Holy Spirit to make that decision today. Because it's the most important decision they'll ever make in their life. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's anybody struggling with that today, Lord, speak to them clearly this morning. That they may reach in their, that pocket, fill that card out, let us know that they've made this decision today to follow you. Father, once again, I pray for every, every man, woman, and child in this room, God. I pray for our church, God. I pray blessing over every person. I pray that the favor of the Lord will fill every life. I pray, God, that the joy of the Lord will fill every home. And, God, that we will be careful to worship you with our lifestyle, with our language, with everything that we do. May we worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. Change our lives, God. May your word change us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Listen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about our church or give to our ministry, please visit our website at Bethel.ag.